So we left off talking about transparency. Yeah. Let me sort of segue into... Um, let, let's talk a little bit about client acquisition. Sure. And, but before we go into that, I just wanted to briefly touch on um, having a niche market. Mm-hmm. Now, there's... You know, I've heard architects in both camps, some saying generalist is where it's at. When one industry's down, you can move over to the next one. I've heard others say that it's more important to focus on a niche market. What's your take on that? Well, um, that's a great question. I think when you first start... Okay, so here are my thoughts. Um, I think most architects, when they first go out on their own, they choose to practice what they've already been practicing because that's the skill that they have. And um, that's practical, right? But the part of me that has an almost MBA says that that seems like a crazy way to choose your market segment. The way that you should choose your market segment, you know, they tell us is, okay, what are the potential markets? How much money is there in each potential market? And how many competitors are there? And then you kind of find the one that makes sense. Oh, maybe that one sort of balances not having that many competitors with a fairly large and growing segment. I think I'll go after that one. And then you hire the people who have the skills to go after that segment. So that's academically how I would tell you that you should be doing it. Um, However, most of us don't have the luxury of doing that I mean, you have the luxury of hiring whoever you want to hire, so you should do that. However, it's very difficult to find the information, the market information, the market research on which segments, how big they are, how much they're growing, and how many competitors are in those spaces. You know, we don't have large firm, large sections of our companies with, that are just doing research on that all day and all night like, you know, Intel does. So you have to figure out how to do that on a more grassroots level. Um, So what we did was we started out general saying, well, we can do this, that, and the other thing. And we just started selling it. And whatever people bought, that's when we were like, well, maybe that starts to become our niche. So that's the more practical way of doing That's You know, that's the way that startups in general should be doing market research is that they go out there and try to sell something, and then they get feedback. And the feedback is either, yeah, people are wanting to buy what you're selling, or they want something a little bit different. And you have to be smart enough to listen to what the market's telling you. So we went out, and um, you know, and we're still pretty much in this phase where we're going specifically to people that we want to work for and saying, here's our set of talents. What do you think you could use us for? And then what they buy is what they buy. So... Interestingly, we found um, several opportunities where what they actually wanted to buy were our BIM skills, not our architecture skills. So we ended up augmenting another team that was already designing or had already designed a building, but were lacking in BIM skills. And so we were able to augment them in that way. So, you know, we took those jobs, of course. In other instances, you know, they were, they were traditional architecture roles, um, typically under a design-build structure. So... That's, that's what I would recommend. But, yeah, you need to move away from the point where you're just a shotgun approach to the point where you're selling probably two or three niches is what I would recommend. One niche is more dangerous because, like you said, you know, everything's cyclical in this, in, in this industry. So you, you do need to spread that out into two or three niches. The unfortunate truth is that with building, none of the niches are particularly counter-cyclical, which means that mm. when one goes down, they all go down. Uh, the best that you can hope for is something that has a lag in it, like um, healthcare projects have a lag because the funding is generally approved quite a long ways out from when they get built. So even when a, a recession starts to happen, those initially approved buildings will already go through. Good. All right. Thank you. Mm-hmm. So if if you had if you sat down with the beginning architect or someone who was maybe struggling with their current firm. Yeah. What what advice could you give them for business development? How to reach out to clients? How to find people uh, that want to hire architects? Okay, so um, first question is, are they doing residential or commercial? Um, because I think that if you're doing residential, you have a lot more opportunity for web-based marketing mm-hmm. than you do if you're doing commercial. I think if you're doing commercial, uh, nobody's looking at the web. <laughs> yeah. um, now, you can correct me if I'm wrong, because I know you have some expertise in this area. 
But, you know, if you're doing commercial projects, like if you're working for a large organization, if you're working for corporations, healthcare, you know, education, the people who are making decisions about who to hire are men, white men in their late 60s. Um, and they're not going to be surfing Facebook, I'll tell you that. <laughs> You know, all that business development in those realms needs to happen face to face. And my one recommendation is that you need to start making friends with general contractors right away, mm-hmm. and um, network with them because they they often have very robust marketing departments and they're really well connected. Um, and you, as a startup, don't have those resources, so you need to leverage the resources you have, which are friendships with whoever you can get your hands on. Um, and so you need to ask for meetings, you need to meet with people face to face, and then you need to follow up with them frequently after that. And it will take nine months to turn a relationship into a project, minimum. So that's the unfortunate truth. Now, if you're doing residential, um, there are a couple of tools that one of them um, is new, and it's called House, H O U Z Z. Um, and that's a website where you can post your pretty pictures, and it's very important to invest in getting pretty pictures, especially if you're doing residential. Um, you can post them there, and people can discover you and then can contact you through that website. Um, I know real people who are getting real work from that website, so I, I can recommend them. And then uh, Pinterest is another way that people are now you know, researching designers that they like. If you're doing residential stuff, it's pretty, you know, it's, it's used in that market. So all the same as what you're doing in commercial, but on top of it, you can also do some web marketing if you're doing residential. Wonderful. Now, how important would you say an MBA is to to an architect who wants to run their own firm or boost their production in the one they have? I would say that it's not really the MBA, but it's the business acumen. It's the information. Um, I think that they are incredibly expensive. I think they're overpriced. <laughs> I'm slightly bitter by the amount of money I've had to pay for my MBA. Um, people tell you, you know, get an MBA instead of taking individual courses in business because it will give you access to the alumni network. And I think that is very valuable, but not if you're going to be an entrepreneur in architecture. Mm. Um, okay, so for instance, at, at Cal, you know, almost everybody going there is going to be working in the tech world. Mm-hmm. So. If I want to network with, you know, um, computer companies, software companies, that will be helpful. But if I don't, then then that network is not particularly valuable to me. Um, however, the one thing about an MBA that is extremely valuable, if you're an architect, is that it shifts your culture, your internal um, identity from being an architect or artist or engineer or whatever you think of yourself as to being a business person. And maybe you can make that attitude shift in some other way. Maybe you can't. For me, I had to actually go to, go into the MBA program, surround myself with people who expect to be running businesses, mm-hmm. expect to be making high salaries, mm-hmm. you know, who, who run in those circles. I had to surround myself with those people in order to sort of reset my mental image of who I was. Mm. And that's what gave me the ability to walk into any room and network like a pro and take people's cards and follow up and ask for work. So if you already have that, maybe don't get an MBA and maybe take a lot of business courses and read books. Okay. Fascinating. Fascinating, Osha. Now, just to finish up here, I'd like to move over into the concept and the the, um, the area of women, specifically mm-hmm. as architects and yeah. as entrepreneurs, because I know I've you know reading your blog, I can see you've taken a bit of a leadership role in mm-hmm. uh, reaching out to other women, mentoring other women, and talking about the challenges of women uh, in general, but also in architecture. And I know, being a male in architecture, that it must be difficult for females in our field because it's there's a lot there's a lot of challenges I guess so could you speak to um, some of the challenges in architecture that you find as a woman sure um, I would say that I have not encountered uh, with one exception any real prejudice um, sorry two exceptions any real prejudice against me as a woman it's been pretty easy for me to you know talk to even the most grizzled builder, you know, and, and get things done. Because people generally respond to your level of competence. 
and your level of confidence. Those two things go hand in hand. Um, the, the reason it's so difficult in, the reason why our licensure numbers are so different in architecture, I think the last I saw was roughly 70% of licensed architects are men, is because of the flexibility of the hours thing. And our industry is so focused on you need to be at your desk from 8 a.m. to 6 or 7 or 8, you know, that it makes it very difficult for people who are raising kids, they have to choose between the two, and then we both know that it's going to be the wife that chooses, you know, to cut back her hours um, because of the current situation of our society. So that's an interesting reason why so many of the, of the sole proprietorships are owned by women because women flee the corporate setting uh, in architecture at enormous paces and they start up their own firms because they need some ownership over their own schedules. Yeah. And that's part of why I did it too, you know. And so it I don't know, it's 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 a double edged sword because you're taking control but you're also leaving a corporate world where you could have fought for a flexible work schedule to make way for the other women coming up below you. So, you know, you make your own decision in that way. Now I've been I've encountered one situation where I was paid 30% less than a man who was doing the same job as me with the same level of experience and the same degree. Wow. And when I found that out, I went to my boss and tried to renegotiate, and he basically said, sorry, you should have been better at negotiating. Um, that was the answer. So that's another reason why I think transparency with rates of pay is extremely important, because I think that uh, that, that situation is way more common than you would think, and if it were transparent, people would know. Um, the other situation I had was where I was at a firm and I was ready to transition from junior into a more senior role and the person who was my boss just couldn't quite make that adjustment mentally and I think a lot of it had to do with he was very comfortable with a woman in a junior role and not so comfortable with her in a leadership role. Mm -hmm. So, you know, those are only two those were only two times in my whole career where I felt like that was really obvious. The rest of the time has not been so much an issue. And the issue, I think, mostly, like I said, is figuring out a flexible work schedule. Okay. Uh, when I, the, the other issue, though, is as an entrepreneur, not so much as an architect. And as an entrepreneur, you know, I've talked a lot about you need to be outgoing, you need to ask the tough questions, you need to walk into a room filled with men 20 years your senior and, and demand work. And that is hard for women. That's hard for a lot of women. Um, and so I highly recommend reading a book called Ask for it, and ask for it is a guide for women on how to negotiate and ask for things, because we have this unique um, this unique dilemma wherein if we are not assertive, you know, we don't get what we want. If we're too assertive, we get punished for being assertive, um, and so you have to walk this fine line of being, you know, nice but competent, yada yada. You know the whole thing. Everybody yeah. knows. But, you know, how you overcome that is a big challenge. So, so ask for it. The book talks about specific phrases to use, specific body language to not use. You know, it's a really good practical guide. Uh, it's not going to fix the, the feminism issue, but it's at least going to help you navigate it if you're a woman entrepreneur. So when I first started the firm, I wanted some fellowship with other females who were entrepreneurs, and I couldn't really find what I was looking for. I found a lot of women's organizations for executives or women cr climbing the corporate ladder, and I found a lot of stuff for entrepreneurs in general in Silicon Valley, but only if you were doing a high-growth, venture capital-funded kind of startup. Yeah. And I didn't find what I wanted, which was women starting normal companies. <laughs> Uh, and I say normal because you know only about one percent of companies are the kind of high growth companies that are going to have an exit, which are called fundable. You know, so I just like I wasn't busy enough. I was like, oh, I'll just start my own retreat. <laughs> so I started something called the Entrepreneurship Retreat, and it's for other women entrepreneurs. And we take a weekend and we go away to the seaside down in Monterey Bay, and we have a series of workshops and keynote speakers on um, the kind of business knowledge that, that if you're lucky enough to get an MBA, you will get. But if you don't have an MBA, you know, you get them. So this is one of the places you can get that kind of, you know, business knowledge. And also it's in an all-women setting, so it has a pretty 
different kind of vibe, and it's in a retreat setting, so you have a mental space to take in the information that you've just learned. So if you want on your, on your resources, we can post a link to that after this. That'd be awesome. Now, I know that this um, entrepreneurship retreat is open to women that aren't just architects, women in all fields of entrepreneurship. Is this something that you could recommend as valuable? There's, there are a lot of single proprietor um, women who do come to my blog. Is this mm -hmm. something that they would find useful? Could you tell them, basically tell them what they would be getting from this retreat? Yeah, absolutely. So um, more than half of the people who attended last year were um, solo entrepreneurs, sole proprietors of various types, and most of them were in the services. And so services industries are architecture, engineering, law, medicine, anything where you're selling a service as opposed to a tangible good. And those, and so, so I do make an effort to gear the workshops um, somewhat towards those women. And the thing that they're going to get out of this workshop, besides you know a network and support, is that they're going to have they're going to walk away with a more disciplined view of their company. So just because your company has only one employee, that's you, does not mean that you should not be taking a disciplined view of its finances and the structure and what you're selling to whom, why, how, for how much. All of that stuff should be addressed in the same rigor as you would if you had a larger company. And so that's one of the things they're going to get for my weekend. Wonderful. Well, Osha, thank you so much for the, the interview, for your time. If any of my viewers want to reach out to you and connect, what's the best way to get a hold of you to contact you? So on my website, at the bottom of every page, there should be an email address. And my website is boiledarchitecture.com. Okay, wonderful. Now, just real quick, Boiled Architecture, tell me where the name comes from. That's pretty unique. Oh, well, yeah, so I get that question a lot. Um, strangely enough, in California, if you incorporate as an architecture firm, you're required to name it after a founder or an owner, and you're required to have the word architects or architecture in it. So when I incorporated, I was required to name it some version of like OSHA Wilson Architects. Um, and so that was, that really bummed me out because, you know, it's based on collaboration. I don't want it to be named after me. So I had to file a fictitious business name or a DBA. And, uh, and I was looking for a name that sounded, um, pragmatic. Actually, I was looking for a name that sounded like, you know, we're not pretentious pie in the sky architects. We're going to design something you can't afford. And so I thought of that phrase, hard boiled, like from a noir novel boiled on the streets of New York. So mm. that's how I came up with it. Nice, nice. Well, Osha, I'm, I'm sure we're going to get lots of conversation about what you've shared today. Once again, thank you for spreading the word. You know, it's a tough economy out there. And, uh, you know, from me and everyone else, we really appreciate your time. So thanks again. You're welcome. Okay. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.